great. Let's get going. And let's pick up where we left off. Let me summarize where we are today and what we're going to be doing and where we've been. So I'm assuming now everyone has their textbook, everyone has the code and regulations, and we're good to go. So let, let's just summarize the material right now to date. So chapter one, the takeaways from chapter one is that everyone should be able to, where necessary, cite to sources of authority, whether they be judicial, legislative, or administrative authority. So you'll hear me throughout the semester, um, both in the classroom and for exam purposes, ask you sources of authority. All right. Uh, aside from authority issues, <coughs> chapter one, I raised issues regarding policy issues, policy objectives. So we talked about equity, horizontal and vertical equity. We talked about administrative ease. We talked about the fact that there should be sufficiency, that the code should raise sufficient revenue. I talked in general terms about the history of the code, but again, for exam purposes, you're not going to be held responsible for those issues. Um, in terms of material for chapter one, again, not a lot here to be tested, but worth your while to read, in my opinion. Chapter two deals with code section 61 and the breadth of income um, and the fact that income is broadly defined under code section 61 and includes all accretions to wealth, illegal, legal, whatever the case may be. With the caveat, at least as introduced in chapter two, about independent life insurance company imputed income, right? That even though the code is quite broad, it does not extend to imputed income. Chapter three. We moved on and we began to look at exemptions to income. And the one in particular was the receipt of gifts and bequests. That under Code Section 102A, that the receipt of gifts and bequests were not subject to tax. The question raised, for example, in Duberstein slash the standing case, what is a gift? What is a bequest, uh, because in the Waldorf case, even if you call something a swan, and it's a duck, it's a duck, right? If you recall, Walter was the, um, the state planning attorney who sought to label a particular request to him as a request, but truth be told, it was compensatory in nature, and it did not qualify um, for 102 exemption of the tax, all right? So we went through chapter two, we got a taste of different cases, <coughs> and chapter three, dealing with gifts and bequests we went through, and we then looked at chapter four. Chapter four, again, the authors are just trying to sensitize us to, notwithstanding the breadth of income, that there are certain things that are excluded. So chapter four looks at items like fringe benefits and explores whether or not they should be taxable or tax-free. We know generally fringe benefits are taxable under Code Section 61 with the caveat that they're not subject to tax because they fall within the scope of Code Section 132. So 132A enumerates many, many fringe benefits which are exempt from tax. And then 132B, 132C, 132D, 132E, 132 there's a litany of code sections that then elaborate what qualifies as a fringe benefit. And then there's special rules like 132H. What does it say? That this benefit extends beyond uh, just merely employees. Extends beyond, and it might include their spouse or um, dependent children or dependent uh, others uh, with respect to certain fringe benefits. There's written reciprocal agreements, 132I. Uh, discrimination rules might apply, 132J. A whole list of rules, 132F, 
uh, deals with qualified transportation fringes. All right, so we went through what qualifies as a fringe benefit. Towards the end of chapter four, we saw that uh, code section um, 119, right? code section 119 deals with the issue of um, meals and lodging, and why meals and lodging might, if it's for the convenience of the employer, be exempt from tax. Uh, we spent some time examining that issue. Right? So those are the first four chapters. Okay. Chapter one is introduction. Chapter two is just a broad overview of Code Section 61. Chapters three and four look at exclusions. We're skipping chapter five. Chapter five doesn't say much. What does chapter five say? Um, it's an affirmation under Code Section 74 as a receipt of prizes and awards are subject to tax. Right? Is anyone surprised by that? No. Right? That prizes and awards are subject to tax. And we're going to spend the bulk of today, not the entirety, I'm sure we will, looking at Chapter 6. All right? Chapter 6. So before I go on uh, and we look at the new material in Chapter 6, dealing with computing gains and losses, anyone have any questions on the material covered to date? Everyone's good? All right. If you do have questions, uh, you'll let me know. All right. So with no further ado, let's look at Chapter 6. Now, there's a few rules of art here that I'd just like to frame the entirety of Code to Chapter 6 before we get into the meat, meat and potatoes of Chapter 6. So, what we're, we're, we have an ever-growing repertoire of code sections. Tonight is no exception. What is the key code section that we're going to be looking at tonight that's going to govern a large part of our conversation? So, since Patrick, you got us chatted out. What, what code section? Uh, 1001. 1001, right? Code section 1001. And essentially, Matt, if you had to um, say to the class or talk in colloquial terms to people, uh, clients, how would you say 1001 of functions, just generally? And by the way, for being videotapes, you've got to be very loud. It always has to be loud because there are a lot of people, but, uh, Matt? Uh, can I take a pass from Ron? Um, you, know, you can always take a pass from Ron. Uh, uh, what? generally, Michael? Uh, it's the, it looks, when you sell property, look for the realization, which is the uh, proceeds minus your justice case. All right, so to compute gains and losses, guys, the formula is not challenging. It's challenging to have a good magic word for that works, but the amount realized less adjusted basis equals gain and loss, right? Amount realized less adjusted basis equals gain or loss, right? That's the formula. And code section 1001 discusses what is the amount realized, 1001B. And adjusted basis, we're going to learn there's several code sections at play when it comes to the issue of adjusted basis. Now, we're going to learn. I think we already got the sense that the code is not necessarily symmetrical in how it treats items. And we said, in many instances, it's asymmetrical. And we're going to see that the rules relating to gains and losses are somewhat asymmetrical. So for, for gains, let's start off with gains. You're going to need two fingers. What are the two fingers? For gains, gains to be reported must be realized and they must be recognized, okay? Two rules. 
For gains to be reported, they must be realized and they must be recognized. And I'll call to your attention Code Section 1001C. 1001C says, except as otherwise provided in this subtitle, the entire amount of gain or loss determined under this section on the sale or exchange of property shall be recognized. So essentially, Code Section 1001C declares all realized gains shall be recognized. Because when in doubt, Congress wants taxpayers, if possible, recognize income and the recognition of income results in more taxable income, you know, greater revenue, tax revenue, right? All realized gains shall be recognized. All right? Now, what about losses? How many fingers do you need? Michael? Three. And why? It's, it's realized, recognized, and allowable. Okay. For losses, they must be realized, recognized, and allowed. They must be realized, recognized, and allowed. So Congress is going to put an extra hurdle in front of losses. Why? Because Congress is nervous that in certain instances, taxpayers might emphasis on the word might, might abuse their privileges, right? And take undeserved losses. So what is the code section that opens the door gain to losses? Gain? 165. 165, right? Code section 165. And if you recall, code section 165 says that the losses can be allowed they must be made for investment purposes. The losses must be for investment purposes. Under Code Section 165C, the losses cannot relate to, per, for example, personal items. So if, for example, you buy a car for $20,000, everybody got it? You buy a car for $20,000, and you sell the car, subsequently sell the car for $25,000, Gain or loss, John? Uh, yeah, gain. Gain of how much? 5,000. Does it get recognized? I think, yeah. For now, let's assume it gets recognized. Everybody agree? Yes. Buy a car for 20, you sell for 25, gain recognition of 5. Oh, yes. Right? Yeah. Well, suppose you buy a car for 20 and you sell it for 15. Can you get the loss? No. If it's for personal use. Okay, for what? If the car is for personal use. If it was for personal use, no. I already agree that most of the cars folks like us will purchase in this room, and if they're for personal use, right, the loss will be disallowed. Now, Code Section 165 is not the only code section that allows and by the same token disallows losses. As I pointed out to you, or I have it, I'll make the point now, there's other code sections. For example, Code Section 267, if you have a sale between related parties, so if, for example, mom buys Google stock for $20,000 and sells it to daughter for $15,000, I wrote out the visual, mom buys stock for $20,000 and sells it to daughter for $15,000, on paper it looks like she should have a $5,000 loss, everyone agree? But Code Section 267 disallows the loss because it's a sale between related parties. All right, so I'm just trying to sensitize you to the fact that if gains generally are going to be recognized, are there exceptions to that rule? Are there exceptions to that rule? Um, in this case, uh, Rudy. Exceptions to the recognition rule? Um, yes. yes. Yes? Yes. And do you have authority for it? No. It's Vishal, did I say that right? Um, Vishal. Vishal. Uh, I'm not sure. Not sure? 
there's any. Julia? Annie? Not sure? Elizabeth? If there's any, you know, we said that gains should be recognized, but I, I'm just asking if there's exceptions to that rule, but they always have to be recognized. Well, installment sales are covered under Code Section 453. They are recognized, or, uh, they're just recognized over time. Uh, Lori? 101C? Say again? 101C? 1001C say that it says that they're always recognized. So I'm just wondering if there's exceptions to that recognition rule. I thought it was unless otherwise divided by another code section. We would, okay, but is there another code section? Francis? Code section 27. 27? Yeah. You know, that deals with credits. You're not going to find it there. Okay. Professor, is it 1015? Uh, it deals with basis issues. But if you read for tonight, how about code section 1041? Right? 1041, right? Sales between spouses. Oh, that one. Oh, that one. 1041, sales between spouses, right? That's a non-recognition provision. Hmm. Is it the only one, Elizabeth? Is it? Anyone have any, anything else that comes to mind? It's not covered in our book, but many of you may have heard about it at work on. Uh, I'm not sure that you've already heard about it. Inherits, somebody passes away and the basis steps up. Yeah, but there's no exchange. That's not, that's code section 1014. But, right. but that's not a recognition. I'm talking about where there's a sale or exchange and the gain does not have to be recognized. How I many of you are familiar with so called lifetime exchanges under code section 1031? Okay. In the most recent tax act, it used to be that you could have tax free exchanges with respect to any so called lifetime exchange. But in the most recent Tax Act, Congress curtailed that and, said, and limited it to only real estate. So now only real estate qualifies for lifetime exchange treatment. Well, well, okay. Code section 1031. 1031 exchange. You can Google that. Ten thirty one exchange. All my my larger point here, guys. The takeaway <clears throat> is that we talked about the breadth. That, as Elizabeth says, <clears throat> or maybe Francis said, that um, all realized gains must be recognized. But we we're learning that, like everything else in the code, there's often exceptions, right? Just like we saw. Uh, position 102A, there's an exception to former 102C, right? So the code, if, if, if there's any um, generalizations we can make, is that um, there's typically general rules and then there's exceptions, right? <laughs> typically general rules and then there's exceptions. Losses, again, must be realized, recognized, and allowed. And we said, we'll see a lot of code sections that provide loss disallowance. Any questions on general rules? Everyone's good with this? We're going to see this play out during the entirety of the chapter. All right? So the authors divide this exercise into two components in chapter 6. First, we looked at adjusted basis. That's the first part of the chapter. What is the taxpayer's adjusted basis? Second part of the chapter deals with amount realized. <coughs> Start off with this case. Not the easiest case to read, okay? Truth be told, there's easier cases. I'll be the first to tell you. Sometimes there's more challenging cases. 
This is more challenging. I'm not sure if I were the authors in this casebook, I, I would run to have included this one in the casebook. But that's okay, it's here. <coughs> Angie, do you have a chance to read it? Um, I was talking about the Philadelphia Park. Philadelphia Amusement Park. And by the way, if I show hands, does anyone ever been on the Schuylkill River or cross it? I'll raise my hand. Mike, you've been there? Yeah, driven over it. You, you've driven over it. Anyone else? All right, I, I see some hands going up here. Okay, so a lot of rowing boats on there, right, Jason? I think there's uh, the University of Pennsylvania and some other tech, uh, Temple, Drexel. I think they all send their uh, rowing teams out there. Anyway, Angie, do you have a chance to read it? Uh, yeah. Do you have a chance to read it? You don't have to know all the facts. It's complicated, but since you're talking to me and you're all the way down here, just make sure you try to project your voice on people in the back of here. So in um, the year 1889, the taxpayer had been granted the 50 years franchise uh, to operate a passenger railway to the park amusement. So um, at a cost, later on at the cost of 381,000, they built a bridge. All right, picture too well, taxpayer builds a bridge, spends lots of money building a bridge. And what happens? So they, they exchange it for uh, another 10 year extended. Okay, so picture too well, um, you have a taxpayer like myself. I own a bridge, and I'm going to use the bridge. I don't have cash, but I have a bridge, and I'm going to pay Angie um, for the bridge a 10 year extension on the use of this franchise so that I have access to the amusement park. Okay? So, everyone, I'm giving her title to the bridge, and in return, she's giving me this intangible right, right? So I can continue a 10-year franchise uh, to cross over to the amusement park, whatever the case may be. Presumably, I feel it's valuable. Okay, keep going. So three years before the franchise, the extended franchise expired, it was abandoned. All right. So three years. In other words, another way of saying the same thing is seven years after I acquire this franchise, this intangible asset, I give it up. Okay. And as a, any normal taxpayer, I want to command a loss, right? Correct. And typically, under Code Section 165, 166, dealing with losses, um, I would want to take um, a deduction equal to my tax basis, right? I would agree that your loss is typically whatever your adjusted basis is at the time you give up the property. Agreed? Code section 165. You have the losses. But we need to know the basis. And that's the issue the court has to examine. Now, typically, what is the basis of property when Angie and I, and I gave up a bridge for 10 year extension in the lease? Right? The franchise. What is the basis I have in this intangible? What is it typically equal to? Uh, is it the amount of 381000 Typically, just go ahead, Rudy. Is it what you receive? Yeah, it's, well, what I receive. The fair market value of what I receive. Everybody agree? Yeah. Yes. In other words, typically in an exchange, my basis in the property is equal to the fair market value of the property, whatever that may be. And that becomes, let's use some code here. What code section would apply? I know what you're thinking. You're thinking code section 1012, right? That becomes my cost basis, right? Agreed? Agreed. Okay? Now, suppose we don't know what the cost, suppose we don't know what the fair market value is of that 10 year extension is. So that's not one of those assets that are regularly bought and sold, agreed? It's not like Apple stock that listed on an exchange, agreed? So usually what you can do to get the right answer, you can look at the value of what is exchanged because if Angie and I are in the same wavelength, you know, uh, in terms of our negotiating skills, we're going to negotiate property of equivalent value. Everyone agree? So 
even though I might not know what the fair market value is of the 10 year extension, whatever I give her will be probably the same value. The challenge in this, right, is last I check, bridges are not typically bought and sold. So even though uh, I'm using a different asset than the 10 year franchise, I'm not using cash, right? I'm using a bridge, which itself is hard to value. Um, just to test you guys out. Anyone know, anyone travel on some private bridges in New Jersey recently? Anyone know of any private bridges in New Jersey? Francis. The Margate one, there's a private bridge there. In Margate? Mm -hmm. How much do you pay to go over it? Uh, 75 cents. 75 cents, anyone else know? I'm not familiar with that one, there's another one I know. At the end of Route 15, Dignan's Ferry, have you guys crossed that bridge? There's a private bridge, I think it costs a buck to pass. I wish I owned it. A lot of people line up and <laughs> both ways and it's a, uh, it's a nice collection they make there for every, you know, every day. All right, so there's some private bridges. I don't know how often they're bought and sold. Probably easier to value than a 10 year franchise. So what does this court decide that the basis for purpose of computing the loss should be the fair market value of the property received. And if you can't figure that out, it's the fair market value of the property you transfer. Does this come up regularly in practice? Do I get a call? Like, so what do you think of this, uh, uh, you know, for purpose of computing? No, this issue does not come up, okay? Because most things in the year 2018, you can, you know, Google it, check it on Amazon. I wonder if you went on Amazon. I did not do this before class. I put in the word bridge for sale. Um, you, you might even come up, you know, with some things here. So it, it, it's an interesting case. It's not one that has much relevance, um, but it just is making a point about how to compute gains and losses, all right? Um, that, that, that's my takeaway. I don't think you have to think too hard about that. I will, I will call to your attention one other item that when you spend money to acquire property, so, for example, you hire an attorney to acquire real estate, and you spend, you know, the real estate costs $100,000, and you spend $3,000 on the attorney to help you acquire the property. You have to capitalize the cost of the legal fees to acquire the property. That's Code Section 212 coupled with Code Section 263. That acquisition costs, you cannot expense immediately. You have to capitalize the cost of the property. Two twelve and what? Code section two twelve and code section uh, two sixty three. If you look at um, on the material on page one nineteen. The footnote one and footnote two uh, affirm the citations. Those are regulatory sites. I gave you the statutory sites. Okay, let's let's go through the problems then on page one twenty. Owner purchases some land for ten thousand and later sells it for sixteen. Right. You hear the word sale, you think to yourself, Code Section 1001, right? Mm -hmm. Determine the amount of owner's gain on the sale. So, based on this, uh, Nick, what do you say? And then Andrew, see if you agree with it. Um, the gain is 6,000. Andrew, agree, disagree. Yes. Okay, what's the now realized here though, Andrew? Just to use our, what code section comes to play? Uh, well, 6,000 is not realized. Uh, the code section, if I'm not mistaken, should be. Draco, what code section? 1001. 1001, right? 1001. But what's the now realized, Andrew? 6,000. Jason, agree or disagree? Um, Miles? I agree. Is the amount realized? 
I just now realized David Devine. Yeah, they haven't realized it's 16,000, right? Amount of cash received. So be careful. Language is important here, right? I don't want people to get confused. The amount realized here is 16. Sixteen. Now, Adam, what's the basis here? What is it? Um, I don't hear you. Um, Ten thousand. What's your authority? Um, the heart. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, it should be ten oh one. The ten oh one B. Well, I'm asking the basis of the property, Kathy. And 12. And 12. Is how much, Kathy? Um, 10, Ten thousand. Gain or loss, Kathy? Okay. Is it recognized, Nick? Yes. What's your authority? That's your work, Matt. So you read the question? What, what is the amount realized here? The amount realized? I mean, amount recognized, I should say. The amount recognized? Yes. Isn't that 6,000? Okay, what's your authority? That would be 1012. That's basis. Michelle? I don't want to see. I don't right? It declares, except as otherwise provided in this subtitle, all realized gains shall be recognized, right? I just want to get into this because this is, you know, if we get the basics here, if you nail the basics, you'll be in much better shape later on. Oh, by the way, in case I forget to make and mention, downstairs, the, um, there is now this coffee shop that's open, okay? so. If you need your caffeine fix or whatever you need, uh, there's actually some food there too. So if you came starving tonight on the first floor, um, that they just opened it up this week. Or I think today was the first day. So if uh, you need your Starbucks club, give a shout. Okay, question two. What difference today about owner purchased the land by paying $1,000 for an option to purchase the land an additional line to us and subsequently exercise the option. So, Trevor, in this case, any gain or loss? Uh, the gain is 6,000. Corey, agree or disagree? Um, agree. What's your authority? Michael? I think it stays the same because of 10, 12. All right, I mean, that's the issue the authors are driving at, right? That your cost basis in problem B is still 10,000, right? Because there's a $10,000 investment. So the amount of realized stays at 16, the adjusted basis here is 10, gain 6, gain recognized Y, 10 on 1, 6. <coughs> Question C. What result to owner B above? If rather than actually acquiring the land, the owner sold the land to an investor or sold the option um, for fifteen hundred dollars. So in this case, Brian, any gain or loss? Uh, yes, five hundred. Five hundred. What's the amount realized? Fifteen hundred. All right, agree. The amount realized is fifteen hundred. What's the basis here? One thousand. One thousand gain or loss? Hey, everyone agree? Yeah. We have uh, 1,500 less. Did I do that right? Okay. Yeah, he sold the option, so there's a $500 gain. Okay, question D. What difference uh, in A, but if owner purchased land by making $2,000 cash payment from owner's own funds 
and uh, an eight thousand dollar payment by borrowing eight thousand dollars from the bank and a recourse mortgage. And would it make any difference if it was non recourse? So, Jacqueline, any difference in outcome? And then Andrew, see if you agree or not. So say it loudly, Jacqueline. No difference. No difference. Andrew, agree or disagree? It's question D. Agree. You're great. Angie? I don't think there's a difference. You don't think there's a difference. And Mike? Agree. So everyone's on the same page, no difference. And again, the authors were trying to get to the point of what? That the basis here, the cost basis, if you use your own money or borrowed money, the basis remains at $10,000. Agreed? Yes. So therefore, they now realize with stay at 16, the basis would be 10, right? And the gain recognized would be 6. Now, as you pay off the liability, okay, everyone get the visual? And you're going to gradually pay off the liability. Name, as you pay off the liability, does it have any bearing on basis? Say no. Alvin, agree or disagree? So as you start paying down the eight thousand dollar mortgage, <coughs> any bearing on basis? No. No bearing. Angel, agree? Okay, I'll go with. No bearing. All right. The basis. Okay. Well, if you buy something. For two thousand dollars cash and eight thousand dollars borrowed money, the basis would be remain at ten thousand dollars. And as you pay off the liability, the basis remains the same. Okay. So if your notes, the answer would be the same. <coughs> Question E. What result in A? Owner purchased the land for ten thousand. Spent two thousand dollars clearing the land prior to sale. Sold it for eighteen. Okay. So, in this case, um, Perla. Two fell. See if you agree with uh, Perla. Perla, any gain or loss? <coughs> I think there is a gain because the 2000 they at the end of the day, it's based on beautifying the property. Well, what code section applies on the sale of the property? <coughs> what code section? You hear the word sale, what code <laughs> section applies? Well, let's start with code section 1001, right? Section 1001 saying the amount realized less adjusted basis. Now, what is the amount realized? D. Hold on. 18,000. 18,000. Everyone agree? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, the amount realized here is 18,000. Okay. Jubel, what's the basis here? Sorry, I don't have the, uh, the question. Okay, EK, do you have the. What's the basis? Uh, <coughs> one, a ten or one C. Yeah. All right, that's talking about the game recognized. I just want to know the basis, Rudy. Twelve thousand. Twelve thousand. Leo, you agree? Uh, yeah, I agree. What's your authority? Um, I just know that like it will be included in the closing cost. So yeah, but you can't say that to your supervisor or client. Yeah, exactly. I just know it's dangerous, right? David? 10, 12. Well, 10, 12 would say the basis is 10,000. What's the proposition that the basis is 12? Michelle? 10, 12. Well, 10, 12 again is your risk gain? 10, 16. 10, 16, right? That's section 10, 16 says you have to increase the $10,000 basis by 2,000. So the basis here becomes 12,000, right? And then 
You can all handle the challenging math. depreciation deductions. Well, that's going to cause a reduction of your tax basis, right? But if you improve it, in this case, spend $2,000 improving it, that causes tax basis to go up. So we have our original cost basis, code section 1012. We have adjustments under 1016. And then a byproduct of that is we have adjusted tax basis, code section 1011, right? That will be known as our adjusted basis. Question F. What difference in result in um, the above if owner had previously rented the land for a lessee for $1,000 per year of cash rental and permittedly lessee expend $2,000 clearing the property? So we're back to problem A. Um, we're back to problem A, right? So we want to know if this were the fact pattern, right? Um, what is the gain or loss here? So in this case, Patrick, what's the amount realized and gain? See if you agree. Uh, not realized. Eighteen thousand. What's that? Eighteen thousand. Eighteen thousand. Gain. Agree. I agree. Have it. What's the basis here? Do you have a number of mine? And then we're going to ask Annie if she agrees with it. Is that a yes? Do you have a number? What? No number? Annie, number? Is the basis? How did you get a number of 5,000? Frank, you feeling richer? Uh, 
Personally, I do, but 1019 is saying that the basis isn't adjusted by improvements made. Right, but just answer my question, and then we'll get to code sections, okay? Yeah, I feel richer. Okay, everyone agree? If someone makes $2,000 of improvements on your property, you feel richer. Agree? Yes. Okay. You should. Now, should you be taxed on that? Ron, should you be taxed? I, if you made two thousand, no, no, I, I made two thousand improvements on your property, Brian. I, I shouldn't be taxed. You shouldn't. Why not? Um, Seriously, why shouldn't you be taxed? Can we, in chapter two, say the breadth of income? Yes. It's very broad. Everybody agree yes. that all accretions to wealth should be subject to tax. And here, Ron, I'm, a, I'm causing your wealth to. Increase and you're telling me not taxed, so you better have authority for the proposition you're not taxed. Francis, is he right? Uh, yes. Do you have authority? No. Does that have a gut instinct? Michael? He should be taxed. He should be taxed. Categorically? Yeah. Job on the line kind of thing, Mike? I would tax him on. Would Mike be right, John? Anyone say no? Frank, would you say no or should he be taxed then? I think no if I'm interpreting uh, 109 correctly. Okay, what is 109? By the way, notice where 109 is placed. Isn't 109 strategically placed very close to 102 and 101 and 103? All those exemptions from tax, right? Everyone agree that code section 109 is where there's an exemption. And what does it say, Frank? Gross income does not include income other than rent derived by a lease or real property on the termination of a lease representing the value of such property attributable to buildings erected or other improvements made by the lease state. Ah, so if someone makes $2,000 worth of improvements on your property, Ron, <laughs> right? No taxable income. What's your authority? Code section 109, right, Francis? We have authority, because otherwise, in the absence of authority, it would be taxed, right? Everyone agree? But logically, why shouldn't it be taxed? It's a capital gain. Well, there's no capital gain because, remember, there's no sale exchange. But you're saying, Turpel is saying, from a policy perspective, which is the right way to think, I don't know if I want this on tape, but WTF, why isn't this tax? Right? Right? Fair statement. Everyone got it? So, Frank, why not taxes? Um, well, I guess this isn't like a barter, right? Like I didn't say you can make these improvements, and I, I will. Oh, but yes, you did. Because you would never have let me make this, these improvements, and I couldn't without your permission. Everybody agree? Like, you're never going to let someone make improvements on your property unless I get your written or tacit approval. Agreed? Because I would be in violation of the lease. So, for sure, the landlord has to give some sort of approval. Agreed? There's no part. I never said that I'm going to exchange your rent for this. That's fine, but I mean, to the contrary. This, this is not a substitute for rent payment. If it were a substitute for rent payment, would Code Section 109 apply? Let me reframe that. Why would, if, why would it apply? What do you mean? Well, in this case, I'm assuming he's spending the $2,000 That's me. I'm spending the 2000 Right. You on your property. No, no, I still have to pay the rent. The rent is $1,000 a year, so sense. this is not in lieu of rent. I'm still paying the full rent. If I paid you by making improvements like we saw in Chapter 2, that's fully subject to tax. 109 doesn't apply. That's right. 109 only applies, right, Perla, if it's not in substitution of rent. So why is this here? Because Ron is, Ron uh, is, is or Jufel is upset. Like, why is it here? So, you were going to say, go ahead, Trevor. It would be because when you just add that to your basis afterwards. Well, we have some peanut butter and jelly sections here, right? 109 and 1019 go together, right? In other words, if I make this improvement to Frank's property, he doesn't have income, but we're not going to let him increase his tax basis, right? Now, I don't want to belabor this, so, Trevor, you'll see if you agree with the logic here. Think to yourself, Solon's going to make the improvement to your property. 
and I'm really going to spend two thousand dollars. To you personally, is it worth two thousand? So, Frank, what do you think? If I make improvements, is it worth two thousand? Maybe, maybe not. One thing's for sure, I can guarantee you. It's worth at least a dollar. Because if Frank thought it was going to increase the value of his property, he wouldn't let me do it. Everyone agree? Now, Frank's not sure, I'm a, he's truly not sure what it's worth. It's worth more to him with it than without it. But there's another thing that also plays a role here. If we try to tax Frank, Currently, does he have the liquidity to pay the tax? Because I make this improvement, right? And he doesn't get his land back if it's a five-year lease for five years, agreed? So, and he's worth, he thinks it's worth something. Maybe he thinks it's worth 500. Maybe he thinks it's worth 2,000. Maybe he thinks it's worth 5,000. We don't know. But Congress says, you know what? We don't, it's not an ideal time to tax him. Why don't we wait? We're not going to allow him to justice basis. And if the property really goes up by 2000 when he sells the property, we'll get the money then. And if he sells it for a lower value, that means, well, maybe the improvement wasn't that valuable. If he sells it for a greater number, hey, that improvement was there. But there's no leakage, right, to the code. Well, by, by giving code section 109, it's an acknowledgement that there's a lack of liquidity. And we know liquidity is, doesn't always control, right? If you recall from the, the, the person who bought the baseball worth a million dollars, treasure trove, right? Um, the fact that you don't have liquidity doesn't dictate tax outcomes. But it, it may be a factor in crafting a code section, for sure. Um, but here, there's no linkage to the system, because ultimately, we know if he sells it for 18, which was sold here, what's the basis? It remains at 10. Code section 1019 says the basis remains at 10, so the gain here would be 8. There's no linkage here. So he's just beautifying it for, because if you're living there or using it, he just wants to make it better for his own use. Be careful with the word he. The landlord or the lessee? My apologies. Well, tell me, I'm, I'm not sure. Oh, for the rest of the so class, to The lessee. <laughs> He's only improving it for his That's own. me. Yeah. I'm improving it, but I, I know Frank likes what I'm doing because he wouldn't let me do it otherwise. And your question is? So, sorry, the lessor. He's only, the lessor is improving it. Well, not the lessor. I'm the lessee. I'm the one making the improvement. Yeah, you're only doing it for your personal. Well, when you, you say it, I think it's going to make it more <laughs> profitable. Keep going. I'm just wondering how you distinguish it from, well, I guess, this case, could you? I'm, I'm stuck on the whole rent hole. Like it's, it's well, it's not a substitute for rent. I'm right. still paying rent. But could you mask it as a substitute for rent? No, because if the fair market value of rent is a thousand, I'm paying something less. This is a rent rent substitute. There's no getting rent. Check off. If 1019 10, didn't apply, then the adjusted uh, basis would be eight in this case, right? Yeah, twelve. Right. Twelve. If it didn't apply. But 109 and 1019 go together. Okay? Okay. I guess the question would just be what's the motivation for like the receive that? What makes me want to wake up and go clear? Because I think I'm going to make such an improvement of 2000 and my profits for the next three years are going to be $4,000 extra per year. Yeah, that's what I was saying. That's what I mean. So. When I wake up in the morning, that's what motivates me. Even though ultimately this benefit's going to inure to Frank. I'll do it because it's a win-win situation. And Frank's just serendipitously a benefactor. Okay. okay, question G. What difference in result in A above if when the land had a value of 10000 owner of real estate salesperson received it from employer as a bonus for putting together a major real estate development? Owner then paid a 30% tax for $3,000. So that's the question, is that in this context, uh, in A above, um, first of all, let's take a, is that in A above, if the land had been sold, we said for 16,000, well, what's the amount realized here? John, two Johns in a row. John and John, what's the amount realized? Um, 
That would be 16. 16. Other John, what's the basis here? Ten. Would it be 10? David, do you agree? Just David? Yes, David here. Yes, you. Uh, Second no, tier. I don't agree. What do you think it should be? 3,000. How much? 3,000. 3,000. Dan, agree or disagree? I think it's 10. Think it's 10? Brian? Uh, oh, man, we've got lots of different answers. So, Mike, you want the final word? I'd say 13. No, how did you get 13? Uh, 10, 15, D. 10, 15 deals with gifts. This is no gift. This is in the, in the realm of compensatory, right? So, can't, can't go there. BK, any thoughts? 10,000. 10,000. Why? Because paying 3,000 is just his income, not included in... What's his income? Uh, what is it? 10. Does he get a basis adjustment upward for the taxes paid to go from 10 plus 3? And if you say so, if you're nodding, you fail. What's your authority? You're not going to find it. Code section 1016, there's no adjustment made for income taxes paid, right? Your basis in this property would be 10,000, right? It's essentially, if someone pays you with property, right? You take a basis equal to cost, or $10,000. So your basis here would be 10,000. It would not be adjusted by the income taxes paid. Why? Because there's no authority for that. So if someone gives you property, What's your basis in that property? To pay you, right? They're paying you with property. Your basis is equal to fair market value, right? Because essentially it's your cost basis. They, it's as if the real estate person was paid with cash of 10,000, and they used the cash to acquire the land, right? Isn't that the equivalent of what happened here? That the person really got cash, used the cash to buy the land. So your answer for problem G, again, is $6,000. Problem H, what difference if owner is a salesperson of an art gallery, the owner purchases a $10,000 painting from the art gallery, but is required only to pay $9,000, not $10,000 because of a qualified employee discount. Owner later sells the painting for $16,000. Vikram, Nick, and Andrew, what do you guys say is the out realized here? Thousand. Say again? Nine thousand. You say nine thousand. Oh, uh, the amount realized? I mean for the sale, right? Yeah. Okay, sixteen thousand. The amount realized is sixteen. Nick, what would you say is the basis now? Nine thousand. So you would say the basis is nine, you would say the gain here is seven. Yeah. Vikram, agree or disagree? Now, who would argue otherwise? Does anyone, would anyone argue otherwise? Is everyone going to... Angel? What do you think? <clears throat> anyone have a different answer? Now, let me ask you a question. Nick, you were going to say something? Uh, is, is it excluded from gross income because of, it's like an employee discount? Well, everyone would agree that the employee here got a qualified employee discount, agreed? Yes. Yeah. And could exempt $1,000 for income, right? Everyone agree? Yes. And that was bona fide, agreed? And you might argue in this problem, and we know the amount realized is 16. Could you argue that the basis was 10, not 9? Could you? Well, you could. Frank, are you going to say something? It's fair market value for everybody else. 
except for that employee, so you could argue that's the basis. Well, you could argue that if you don't give him a basis of 10, you've essentially undermined the qualified employee discount, right? Like, you have competing code sections, right? All right, great. As you're thwarting code section 132 by taxing him on 7 rather than 6. Okay. But look at code section 132C4. deals with qualified discounts, right? Everyone agree? 132C deals with qualified discounts. Agreed? Agreed. 132C4 says qualified property or services. The term qualified property or services means any property, and look at the parentheses, other than real property and other than personal property of a kind held for investment. Stop there means any property other than real property and other than personal property of a kind held for investment. Does it, like when this person bought the painting, everyone agree, when the person bought the painting and they, the person, the employee hung it on his or her wall, was that for business or investment purposes? Presumably for personal reasons, right? Yeah. They bought the Picasso, they want it on their wall, and it looked great. Okay, everyone agree? Yeah. I, how many of you are familiar? I'm going to share a secret that uh, I shouldn't say on video because I don't think my wife's watching. Um, speaking of Picassos, are you guys familiar, anyone familiar with Degas, the ballerina? The statue. No. I skipped my little story. All right. I figure if you're talking Picasso, you guys might uh, talk about a little artwork. But if you get bored, you can look up Degas. D E G A S, not Degas. That's the way I normally would press, but I understand in French you drop the S. Okay. Uh, and you look up the ballerina. You would probably be familiar. You've seen that statue before. Anyway. Um, why am I telling you this? If you buy a Picasso and you put it on your wall, can you get a qualified employee discount? Absolutely, right? You work for an art gallery, you should get a qualified, if, if the, your employer permits, a qualified employee discount. Agree? Agree. Sure, code section 132C. But, if you turn around and sell it, all of a sudden that, that property changes its nature, right? Are you holding it for personal reasons or investment reasons now? Investment. And if you're holding it for investment, guys, all of a sudden you're less concerned, like the person should not have gotten the discount in the rear view mirror. So it makes sense to use this answer, right? To fell if we want a policy reason, because now we have a policy. They really bought it for an investment. If you buy things for investment, you shouldn't have a qualified employee discount from inception. They're not going to make you amend your return, but it would make sense then to use the $9,000 as the adjusted basis. If you're not buying it for personal purposes. When a person buys it, it's going to be hard to know what they're buying it for, but when they sell it, it's clearly that they did it for investment purposes, right? All right. All right, question two is not my favorite question. Uh, why is it, I, I like to ask questions that I think are much more practical in nature because those are the things that your clients will ask you. They will not ask you hypothetical questions. So question two talks about an arm's length exchange. It says Sharp exchanges some land with a cost basis of six thousand and a value of nine thousand with Dahl for some non-publicly traded stock which Dahl owns and which Dahl has a basis of eight thousand and worth 10,000. So if you get the message there, Dull is not only dull, but Dull is dumb, right? Because Dull is exchanging property worth 10,000 for property worth 9,000, right? So uh, not the smartest or swiftest, sharpest blade in, in the tool kit, right? So 
So the adjusted basis is 6 and 8, and the fair market value of the property being exchanged is 9,000 and 10,000. Okay? So Sharp is exchanging 9,000 fair market value for 10,000 fair market value. And the question is, in that case, compute the gain and loss. Well, Dull is getting um, giving up property. Uh, how do I say? Um, Dull is getting property worth nine thousand with an adjusted basis of eight thousand. Right? How much is the gain you recognize if you? Get property worth nine with a basis of eight, one thousand. So theoretically, Dole would have to report a base gain of one thousand. And Sharp is giving up property with a basis of six and receiving property with a basis of ten. Everyone right, agree? Right? So Sharp should have to report four thousand dollars worth of gain. Now, what about if the value of stock, if the dull stock cannot be determined with reasonable accuracy? If the value is dull, so what value do we use if we can't figure out that this is truly worth 10, which is very unusual, right? Philadelphia the amusement park, right? Then use the value of what's given, so let's say it's 9,000. You reduce the value of what's given, right? So in this case, what would be the gain and loss? The gain to Sharp would be 3,000, right? Because he gave up something worth, uh, well, gave up something with a basis of six, and it's gonna be presumed to be worth nine, right? Because we're gonna use the value, we're gonna use nine as the value, that's what, what he gave up, because we can't figure out theoretically what the value of what he received. And Sharp, excuse me, dull, we know he wrote something with a basis of eight with a fair market value of nine. So once again, Dole's gain would be 1,000. Again, guys, this doesn't come up in practice. Not my favorite problem. So I don't want to, this is just the author's gone wild with respect to uh, Philadelphia Amusement Park. So uh, just an illustration that once in a great while, we have to use the value of what we know, not the value of what we don't know, okay? And we move on. Property acquired by gift. So we know the receipt. Go ahead, Rudy. Uh, just going back to that case, um, was the taxpayer able to use the undepreciated value for the basis or not? You mean in Philadelphia Amusement yeah. Park? I think that's what they decided, the court. But the holding on the case is less important than the instructions, Rudy. Because I think that was the only, if I, you know what, I, I, I want to, they, they actually remanded the case, Rudy, that it, meaning that they couldn't decide themselves. So based on what they said, was the status of the law. They remanded it to the lower court to determine. And they probably settled it because there is no, at least to the best of my knowledge, there's no subsequent case history about this. So the IRS and taxpayer ultimately probably settled. So we never have final resolution. All right, someone gives a gift. We know under Code Section 102A, under Code Section 102A, the receipt is not subject to tax. The receipt is not subject to tax. but. What is the ba basis of the, the recipient? What basis does the recipient have in the property? And picture, if you will, picture, if you will, and Kathy Bowers takes a simplified problem. Suppose I buy stock for a thousand. Picture, if you will, I buy stock for a thousand. Google stock for a thousand. I gift it to you when it's worth two thousand. 
Everyone agree? All right. Everyone hear me? So I, I buy it for a thousand. I gift it to you when it's worth two thousand, and you sell it at five thousand. Everyone have the mineral? Yeah. The question Taft has to answer. And keep in mind, it's a 1929 decision, which means the Internal Revenue Code or its predecessor is in its relative infancy, right? 1929. Because people are still trying to figure out what is an income tax. The taxpayer argues should only be taxed on three thousand dollars because in the taxpayer's hands, everyone agree. The daughter here had only appreciated by $3,000. Yeah. The IRS says, no, 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 no. You should be paying tax on $4,000. Should be paying tax on $4,000. And tries to say that the IRS says, that's perfectly constitutional, and the court has to examine whether or not the U.S. Supreme Court could a person be taxed on only three thousand, or was four thousand within the realm of constitutionality? Again, we're not going to embark on constitutional issues, but this becomes a, at least in this case, the court made it into a non-issue. Jacqueline, do you remember who wins here? Taxpayer or yeah. taxpayer loss. Okay, everybody agree? <coughs> taxpayer loses. Uh, the court has no problem saying that, hey, you accepted this property, you accept all the consequences associated with the property, the adjusted basis should be a thousand dollars. Alright? So not a hard case to read. Okay? What's the authority on? Code section, ultimately, Code Section 1015A. 1015A. Yep. Yeah. Now, we have this Fareed case beginning on page 124. Right. So I don't know if I had a chance to really indulge in this case. Mike, do you want to tell us what happened here? So I think the basis here was... Let's go over the facts before we get to the basis. So the facts were, uh, this, there was a woman here, um, a petitioner, who had a prenuptial agreement with a gentleman. Uh, before they got, she got married, uh, he quote-unquote gifted her stock at a certain value. All right, so to keep this woman in the game, okay, he gifted her stock. Just there's some little tidbits here. Why are you still married? Why are you still married? And was there any age difference here, Michael? Yes, he was in his 50s. She was in her 30s. Right. Everyone noticed. I mean, these are the kind of things, aside from tax, um, you may want to pay attention to because he's 57, she's 32. All right. So slight age difference, but who's counting, right? Um, and he's keeping you in the game by saying, here's some stocks, you know, don't worry, I'm gonna be yours as soon as I get out of my, my marriage. And then what happens? So he eventually gets out of his marriage. They eventually divorce. Oh, but hold on, you, you forget a critical fact. He, he gives her more stocks, yeah, right? And there is a prenuptial agreement in which she gives up certain rights, yeah. okay? Everybody hear this? She essentially, even the first gift was sort of contingent on marriage. So just picture, if you will, she's going to get a lot and a lot of stock as a result of giving up her rights, all right? Um, and what we would imagine is that neither of them reported that transaction because they, he labeled it as a gift, and you can be sure that he never reported any gain uh, as a result of gifting, giving her the stock. So what's the issue? Because was this the happiest of marriages, Michael? No. No. It, it, it spiraled downward, apparently, soon after. Right? Everyone got the visual? Uh, this was not the happiest of marriage. She, by the way, 
This is Mr. Kresge, the predecessor to the Five and Dime store. He's one of the wealthiest people who walked the planet during the time period involved. So this is not Joe Sixpack. This is Mr. the equivalent of Sam Walton or you know Elon Musk. I mean, he was of that caliber of his time. Okay, and she subsequently sells the stock, and the amount realized is known. Right, everyone knows. What she sold it for. The question is, what is this, her adjusted basis? And what are the what are the differences? What could it be? Go ahead. Uh, her argument was that it wasn't the case. She did this compensation for entering this conventional agreement. Not a compensation, because that would have been ordinary. She, she did it as an exchange. Yeah. She gave up certain marital rights in exchange for getting the stock. 1001 applied. She should have had a cost basis equal to fair market value at the time of the exchange, Code Section 1012. The only problem with that, to me at least, was she never re reported the sale or disposition of her marital rights, but put that issue aside, the statute of limitations is passed. I, I would wonder if there's something called equitable estoppel that could apply here that says you can't argue something in which you yourself didn't adhere to. Put that issue aside. She argues that her basis is, was the fair market value at the time of the exchange, but Mr. Kresge owned only stock, he was the founder. And he had a basis of, I think it was 11 cents or 15 cents 15 per cents. share. What was it, Michael? 15 cents. 15 cents. But she would have had a much, much larger basis if she could use the exchange basis. So who wins? Um, uh, I think, uh, I think she won. Yeah, surprisingly, she won. This is not my favorite case. I would have ruled again. It's just the equities on it just seemed like the government was being whipsawed. But the court said that was a valid quid pro quo exchange. Now, this, this case, by the way, predates Code Section 1041, and whether or not the outcome would be the same is interesting. I will share a tidbit. There's an article written by someone called Linda Gallery. Why am I calling this about this case and its history? If you look at her, she gets remarried to a prince, and that's why she has this kind of interesting name. You might wonder where did this name come from? Farid S. I can't even pronounce the Latin, you know. It, it, and she sort of, it sounds to me, led, led subsequent to the marriage, not the happiest of existences. In fact, this may really surprise you, is that who predeceases whom between these two taxpayers? She dies relatively early in life. He lives to be in his 90s. So even though if you look at these age differences, you might say, well, I know who, who survived who. You just never know, right? So, um, just some little tidbits that I thought you might find interesting. It's not my favorite case. The authors have it here because sometimes so that you can get some unusual outcomes. Let's see how good you are. Let's look at the problems on page 128. Donate property under circumstances that required payment of gift tax. What gain or loss to that required no gift tax? What gain or loss to donate on a subsequent sale of the property if the property cost donor twenty thousand at a thirty thousand dollar fair market value at the time of gift, and the donee sold it for thirty five thousand? So let's just go back and forth and see if everyone agrees with each other's neighbor's answer. So in this case, Miles. Gain or loss here? Uh, I think it's a gain of 15000 15000 uh, At a greater district. What's your amount realized here, Anna? Amount realized? Yes. Uh, 30. Say again? 35000 Amount realized is thirty five. What's the adjusted basis? Yes. Say it loudly. Yes. What's your authority? Is that hard? 10-15, right? Everyone agree? 
You now realize here is 35, the basis is 20, gain of 15. Dan, is it recognized? Uh, yes, this is a recognized. What's your authority? It's, it's based on the number of so. Is that right, Kathy? Yeah. Yeah. Yes? Oh, I asked you if the game is recognized, Nick. What code section? 1001C. 1001C, right, Tia? Everyone agree? Matt realizes 15, basis of 20, gain 15, gain recognized, right? For your notes. Everyone has it. No problem with that. Everyone's good with that, Just right? One more time. Just repeat it. Matt realized 35, basis of 20, code section 1015, gain recognized 15. Authority 1001C. Suppose we sell it for 15000 Matt, any gain or loss? The uh, $5,000 loss. Okay. Why, Ben? What's the amount realized? Uh, let's see. The amount realized was 15000 Basis? Uh, 20000 Gain or loss? How much? 5,000. Ronald, recognized? Um, yes. YDK, is it allowed? Well, actually, I missed that question. Is the loss allowed? Uh, no. Too well, you agree? Oh, uh, I think we lost the address. What code section? Um, one second. Carla, is it allowed? 165. 165, sure. We sold it for 25. Okay, then I lost my. What's the basis here, Vikram? Nick, yeah, what's the basis? Uh, 20,000. All right, 10, 15. Gain here of 5. Vikram, okay. And we know it's recognized, 1001C. So everyone have that. These are the kind of exam multiple choice questions, right? Easy to, <coughs> easy as a professor. Just low hanging fruit for me to ask. Everyone should be able to do this. Same, I'm sorry. Same question. The uh, the adjusted basis is twenty thousand dollars for less than fair market value. It's what? Is it twenty thousand uh, dollars? Yeah, adjusted twenty thousand adjusted basis loss of five thousand. Even though he bought it, the, uh, it cost him thirty thousand dollars. No, no, no. Let, let's do question 1B, and then I'll ask, answer your question. We just did question 1A. Oh, I was Let's do question 1B. Everyone ready? Suppose we had bought, the, bought it for 30, and now it's worth 20. Everyone has a visual? Mm -hmm. We bought it for 30, it's now worth 20. Okay? And we sell it for 35. Jason, gain or loss? Uh, that would be a gain of 5,000. Nick, agree or disagree? Agreed. What's the amount realized? Uh, 35,000. What's the basis? 30,000. Basis is 30, right? Gain of 5. Everyone got that for their notes. Suppose we sold it for 15, John. Gain or loss? Uh, loss. How much? Uh, 15. John, agree or disagree? I agree. Francis, final answer. Uh, David? Me? You agree? I agree. Make different. So hold on. The upper tier David's agreeing. But David, upper tier David. You say, we know the amount realized is 15, right? Yeah. Let's everyone have 10, 15 open. Let's take some 10, 15, over. Okay. 
1015a, if property was acquired by gift after 1920, the basis shall be the same in the hands of the donors or the last preceding owner by whom it was not acquired by gift. Can I read agree? To translate that. That's the that's the carryover basis. I read agree? But notice there's now a comma and it says except. Except that if such adjusted basis is greater than fair market value of the property at the time of gift, isn't it in our case, isn't the adjusted basis in excess of fair market value, guys? Our adjusted basis is 30, the fair market value is 20. Everyone yeah. agree? That's then, for purposes of determining loss, only for purposes of determining loss, fair market value shall be the basis, right? Isn't that what it says? So isn't that an exception to the general rule? Yes. yes. So in this case, Francis, you want to come back and tell me your answer? What's the amount realized? 15. What's your adjusted basis, Francis? Michael? 20,000. 20, right? Isn't it the fair market value of the data gift? So the answer here should be 5. Angie, you got that? It's 5,000. Everyone agree? Yes. Yeah. Everyone see this is an, an important exception. Just say it loudly, too, pal. And, and, I mean, if somebody is in that case, I mean, that leaves a big, uh, like, uh, a room for, uh, to, to do things that can be, you know, done legally by getting an appraisal for a lower market value. Yeah, but often things have, or are, are marketable. I mean, illegally, somebody can benefit from that situation. Listen, you guys respond to people's questions. You, you know, people come to you with appraisals. You're not you're assuming it looks on its face like a bona fide appraisal. But um, Circular 230 says you can use that appraisal. You do not have to second guess the people who prepare the appraisal. So I, I don't want to go down that path. Let's, let's just make sure we get the rules right, OK? Suppose we sell it for 24000 Let's just hold on, Michael, with the, with, with the point. If we sell it for twenty-four thousand, Brian, gain or loss? Gain. Gain of how much? Four thousand. Dan. I think it's going to take the same and have no gain, right? For twenty-four thousand. The same for subject to loss. So, what's your authority? Ten fifteen a. So you would say no gain, no loss here. Right, because it said it's only subject for for calculating losses, correct? It is only for, the exception only applies for calculating loss, and there is no loss here. Okay, so, and for purposes of computing gain, right, we would use 30, right? So on the face of it, there doesn't look to be a gain or loss, but if you don't mind me saying, most of you would be a little unnerved if you said that to a client, right? It just sold something for 24000 and you say, gee, no gain, no loss. And you say, you read the statute, and you have, you know, you're reading the statute. You think you have a good reading of it. Uh, but who knows? However, having said that, can everyone open up to Regulation 1015-1A2? Can everyone open? If you have the 2019 edition, it's page 1505. This is Regulation 1015-1. A2. Does everyone have that open? The example? If you can, just make sure you bring the code of regulations. And to you, close enough, I can see you don't have it. You can't carry it? I'm telling you, I'm going to build your muscles. Okay? If you can bring it, it'd be great because, again, you know, we make lots of references to it. All right. Everyone see the example right there? John, you don't have it either? I'll be sure to bring it next week. All right. Got to bring it. The example says, A acquires by gift income producing property, which has an adjusted basis of $100,000 at the date of gift. The fair market value is 90. Sound familiar? Yeah. Got it? Basis of 100, fair market value is 90. And the property is sold for 95. Sound familiar, guys? 
This is our fact pattern. It says, in such a case, there is neither gain nor loss. The basis for determining loss is 90. Therefore, there is no loss. Furthermore, there is no gain since the basis for determining gain is 100,000. Everyone see that? Would you sleep easier if you said that? Yes. OK. So it's these kind of things you just got to, the authors, again, one of the reasons this is in its 19th edition is if you read the regulations that the author is directed to, they make it pretty straightforward. You know, they, they really want to bring this point home. All right? So let's do this last problem, and then we'll take a break. Any questions? Everyone's good. Go ahead. Where exactly is that? It's regulation 10. You're looking at the code. You've got to look at the regulations. It's regulation 1015-1A2. It's in the back of your code and regulations. And I think from my visual, you were just looking at the code and not the regulations. And if you're looking at the regulations, again, the 2019 version, page 1505. Okay, third, second question. Father had some land. He had purchased for 100,000, but increased in value to 200,000, okay? Everyone have the visual? He transferred it to daughter for $100,000 in cash and a transaction properly identified as a part sale, part gift. Okay? Assume no gift tax was paid on the transfer. Assume that no gift tax was paid. What is the gain to father and what basis to daughter under those regulations? Right? So, Picture, if you will, father owns two acres of land, two identical acres that are worth 200000 and he's selling it to daughter for 100000 Okay, everyone? He's being nice to his daughter, could be more generous, he could have given her the property. He's saying, I love you, but can you pay me $100,000, okay? Everyone got that? Does he have any gain or loss? And not surprisingly, the authors direct you, pinpoint direct you, to the operative regulation. It's 1001-1A. Transfers in the part sale or part gift, part sale. Everyone have that? Regulation Rudy, you got that? 1015 4. Where transfer of properties in part uh, a sale and part a gift, the unadjusted basis of the property in the hands of the transferee is the sum of whatever is the following is, is greater. The amount paid by the transferee or the transfer's adjusted basis. 
What is the amount paid? 100,000. What's the transfer's basis? 100,000. What's greater of the two? It's the same, right? It's 100,000. And then it says increase by um, the amount determined under 1015D uh, for any gift tax paid, but there's no gift tax paid here. So our answer here, and you can follow the four examples that follow, our answer here is father would have no gain, daughter would have a basis of 100,000. Everyone agree? Yes. Now I just want to compare and contrast. Suppose the father, instead of giving it to the daughter, gave it to the American Red Cross. Okay? So in problem 2B, instead of giving it to the daughter, he gave it to the American Red Cross, he said to the American Red Cross, I'm going to give you two acres of land. I'm going to give you two acres of land, but you've got to pay me $100,000. Is the outcome the same? What happens if you give it to the American Red Cross is they actually treat this, the code treats it, as two transfers. Remember, that is giving away two acres, right? Worth the total 200,000. Presumably each acre is worth 100,000, agreed? What's the basis in each acre? 50, right? Because that has an overall basis of 100. So, in that particular circumstance, if dad gives the American, and, and in this case they use, if you look at the book, it's as if he gives it to the daughter. If he sold it to the daughter, how do I say this? If he, if he gives it to the Red Cross for, what I'm saying, for 100000 the code treats it as if dad recognizes 50000 on the sale of one property, and the second property is treated as a contribution to the charity. And I'm just pointing out, for purposes of your notes, question 2B, this is not the state of the law. This is just a hypothetical exercise. And what the authors are trying to depict is that the answer could be quite different if Congress wanted to. They could treat it as if it were truly a sale of one half of the property, as opposed to in problem 2A, they're looking at the whole property. In problem 2B, they bifurcated into two separate transactions. For now, Congress has, has sanctioned the outcome in 2A. The authors are trying to say is, at some point, it might be better from a policy perspective to treat this as if it were two different transactions as if dad had truly gifted one of the acres to the daughter and sold one of the acres to the daughter. So for your notes, don't worry about question 2B. Right now the answer, correct answer is problem 2A. Why don't we do this? Because I don't want you to, downstairs, uh, from what I've been told, that little um, coffee area should be open until 8 o'clock. Why don't we take our nine minute break now and I will be, we'll, we'll pick up where we left off. Okay? By the way, if you don't have your 10 card, if you don't mind, there's more 10 cards up here. Just make sure everyone does. Let's get started because um, there's a fair amount of material I want to cover uh, tonight. Because every night there's a fair amount of material. So, again, gifts, generally not taxable, recipient take, 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 carryover basis. Um, now, we said, for gains, they must be realized and they must be recognized. But we do have several code sections that declare the non-recognition, okay? So it doesn't mean that every realized gain is recognized, just that's your starting salary. Now, we do have, again, 1041, we don't want people to play games with respect to tax basis so 1041, or gains, transactions between spouses, not recognized. Transactions between spouses, not recognized. And um, then reflect in the code section 1041. On page 133, there's a short problem here. 
the current year, Huber holds two blocks of identical stock worth a million dollars. Huber gives the first block for fifty thousand, um, and as a another block that uh, he purchased more recently, nine fifty. So we have two blocks of stock. Block one. Block two. You adjust the basis for block one is fifty. The second block is nine fifty. Both the fair market value of both is uh, uh, one thousand dollars or a million, depending on how many zeros you want to add. That's the fact pattern. All right. And the question is, here you have two blocks, block one and block two. Would you instruct your client to give block one or block two? Okay, everyone understand? You would instruct your client to give block one or block two. So let me just uh, ask uh, Jacqueline, block one or block two? Block two. Block two. Andrew, block one or block two? Your instructor playing to give away block one or block two? Yeah. Um, you say block two as well. Angie? Mm -hmm. Not sure. Not sure? Mike? How old are they? What do you mean by how old? I mean, let's suppose the, the, the securities were bought. Uh, this yeah. block was uh, 20 years ago, this was block two, two years ago. How old's the client? Well, the client is the giver or the receiver? In this case, The giver is 90 years old. Give away two. You say give away two. Mind your hands up, you give away one. You say give away one. Okay, David, who's right? You don't know? Dan? I think it depends on how you want to get that stock. You want, do you want to assume it or do you want to let them? <laughs> I don't know what you mean. So I mean, you have a choice. You can give a million dollars to stock this one or a million dollars to stock which one? This one. You know, which one do you instruct your client to give away? You're holding until death anyway, though, right? Only you're holding. Be careful about you. The recipient is going to hold. Um, they're going to get a gift and then whatever I don't give away. I'm going to hold until death. Right. So and which do I, one? Do I want to help the person I'm giving the gift to out? Well, we always want to help ourselves and not help others, Uncle <laughs> Sam. But the fact that you're giving it away, right, suggests, by the way, I, I skipped ahead and I should have paused. I know I skipped. Hold your thoughts on block one and block two. OK? Hold your thoughts. I got carried away. Very excited about code section 1014. Let's look at page 130 and then we'll we'll get back to that problem. Page 130. We have Andre purchased some land 10 years ago for 40000 The property had appreciated to 70, at which time Andre sold it to his wife Steffi, as in Steffi Graff for 70. Okay? So you, most of you probably watched the tennis controversy. Uh, what was it? U.S. Open. So I probably won't go down that path because lots of people here probably have lots of different opinions. Um, but let's uh, put that aside for a second. Um, any tax consequences uh, to Andre for selling it to Steffi? So let's go up to Dane, Elizabeth, Dane. Dean and Moss here, guys? There's no gain recognized. Elizabeth, agree? Yes. What's it, his authority? 1041, right? That's positive. And Steffi, what's the, uh, I mean, name, what's Steffi's basis in the property? Um, 40,000. What's your authority? Um, okay. Robert, what's his, her authority? Angel, you have authority? Any authority, guys? David? 
Then what? 15A. But it's not a sale. <coughs> Excuse me, it's a sale, not a gift. But what does 1041B say, David? 1041B says, in the case of any transfer described in subsection A, for purposes of the subtitle, the property shall be treated as acquired by the transferee by gift, and the basis of the transferee in the hands of the, in the property shall be the adjusted basis of the transferor, right? So the adjusted basis shall be his adjusted basis. What's his adjusted basis in the property? 40. Are we great? So 1041B for the proposition that he has a $40,000 basis here. What can you do for the immediately resells the property? If Steffi resells the property, Matt? If she immediately resells the property, then her basis is 40. But what's her gain or loss? Uh, 30, if she's selling for 70. All right, do you now realize the 70, the basis is 40, the gain recognized is 30, right? Suppose the property had declined in value. He bought it for 70. It's now worth 30. Right? Everyone get the visual? He sells it to her for 30. Ron, any gain or loss? Uh, <coughs> no. No gain or loss. Why? What code section? Um, 1041. 1041. And by the way, transaction between related parties, there's no loss. Section 267, right? What's her basis in this property, EK? Okay. How much? He bought it for 40, sold it to her for 30. Okay, if it's subsequently sold, okay, to fail, if it's subsequently sold for 30, does she have a loss here? She does $10,000. 10000 okay, she does. So what this is saying is unlike the exception under 1015A, you recall, generally when you give away a lost property and you sell property for a loss, you get, don't get the loss. Everyone agree? Yeah. We just went through several examples of that. In this context, under the 1041 context, you would command the loss. Well, you were going to say? I was going to ask you about the earlier part that you mentioned that if you subsequently sell it, um, you can't get the loss here. You cannot get the loss. You can get the loss here. Steffi Graf would get a $10,000 loss here. Okay? <coughs> What results gains losses as a basis to Andre and Steffi if Steffi transfers the other property with a basis of fifty thousand, a value of seventy thousand, rather than cash to Andre? So, what results gains losses as a basis to Andre and Steffi if Steffi transfers the other property with a basis of fifty? And value is 70 rather than cash on there. The question is, would this be Kathy taxable or not? Kathy? Yeah. Uh, a, <laughs> What's your authority? Is that higher? Uh, 1041. 1041. So even if they both exchange property, they're probably not taxable under Code Section 1041, but you might add one to add to your notes. Code section 1031, right? That this could qualify as a like kind exchange, right? Two pieces of real estate of equivalent value being exchanged, right? All right, so everyone, 1041. 
authors are giving authors are giving us an, an example of a non-taxable transaction between um, related parties. Even though it's recognized, it seems like it's recognized, but there is a non-recognition provision. Okay. Property acquired from its decedent. 1014. Now, what does this rule say in general? Andrew, do you recall? Yeah, um, so generally, the, um, the person who acquires the uh, asset from someone who's passed away, their basis has now changed to what the value was when it was assessed. All right, so when someone dies, the recipient gets a basis equal to fair market value, right? Now, okay, we're going to have the general rule. Property inherited from a decedent, generally you get a basis equal to fair market value. Angel, is that always the rule? Alvin, is there any exception? Nick, any exception? Nick? It's always fair market value. Carla, any exception? Anyone want to raise their hand? Any exception? You guys say this is a written in stone rule? The loss is Well, remember, if someone buys stock for $1,000 and it's at death, it's worth 200 basis becomes equal to 200 period. That rule, that rule cuts both ways. Any exceptions, Mike? If it's gifted within one year. What code section is that? Uh, 1014E. 1014E. So in other words, if you guys look at me tonight and decide soul doesn't have long for the world, and you own stock that you bought for 1000 it's now worth 10000 and you're optimistic, <coughs> and you give it to me tonight, I die next week, and I bequeath it back to you, you get a $10,000 basis, no. Your basis, if you read code section 1014A, your basis in that property would be remain at 1,000, right, Mike? Why did Congress put this in? People are getting smart about it. <laughs> What's that, Elizabeth? If, if I remember correctly, some people were taking advantage of it. Just well, people would look over, you know, their grandparents or great grandparents and say, "Gee." Let me give them appreciated property, they'll give it back to me. And this way you could erase tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars worth of gains, right? Yes, um, But is that only in the one year tax plan? What if the person lives? If the person lives beyond, but I just wrote a piece somewhat about this is that um, are you running a great risk? You know, Let's face it, you might give me property because you think, I'll give it back. But maybe I'll meet a girlfriend, or maybe I'll go into a nursing home, or paint the parade of horribles. So you're taking a risk if the person has more, more kick to them than a year. Some people are willing to accept that risk. But life takes some crazy turns, I've seen. So gotta gotta be careful. Okay? All right. But you might ask from a policy perspective, does Code Section 1014 make sense, right? Isn't that a fair statement? And let me just share with you that 1014 came into being as, to the best of everyone's knowledge, there's an article written by Larry Zeldin. Uh, he's a professor at Duke. Uh, I'm somewhat friendly with Larry. And he wrote a very nice piece that a historical piece that this rule came into being in 1921 as a result of someone in Treasury, an unnamed person, crafting a Treasury regulation that said basis is equal to fair. It was never instituted as a part of Congress until it was, sub it was subsequently codified, but it first appeared as a, in the form of a Treasury regulation. 
and then Congress subsequently made it into law. But why do we have Code Section 1014 here? Why did Congress retain it? Anyone want to venture a guess? Why, why is this in the code? Does it cost the Treasury money to have this code section, guys? Does the Treasury gain or lose money as a result of this? Lose. Lose it. This is one of the biggest tax expenditures in the code because generally, property generally appreciates in value over time. And there's very, um, how do I say, tax favorable expensing rules that exist. So ordinarily basis is less than fair market value, all right, a property. So this rule costs the Treasury billions of dollars. So why does Treasury retain it? <laughs> well, it retained it, at least in the past, for reasons of administrative convenience, right? Because how many of you or your parents or grandparents know the tax basis they have in their investments? And let me just tell you a great example. My wife's um, grandmother, for many years I did her tax returns. And periodically she, she would sell some stock that she had bought in the 1940s and 50s. And I would say to her, great grandma Diana, what was your tax basis? Said, Are you kidding me? Like, no clue. So we would just sort of make it up, right? Because it wasn't big money and what else were we going to do? But that was probably done on a much, much larger scale where people don't know the tax basis, and particularly when someone dies. If you think it's hard to talk to someone when they're alive, think about when someone dies, how do you know for sure what their tax basis is, right, in an asset? Everyone agree? Might be hard to ascertain that. Um, for, your, for your interest in your humor, um, I wrote a piece with Joe Dodge, who was, was at the time at the University of Florida, and we explored this because we know in general when taxpayers estimate who's at, whose favor do they estimate in? Their own, not the government. And we <coughs> said that these estimations were costing on average, the government was forfeiting about $25 billion a year of revenue because taxpayers caused their basis to be higher than what it was, so therefore they reported smaller gains and larger losses. Well, you do that over a 10-year scoring period, and how much does it cost the government? $250 billion. And when you do that, that's a real number. Even for the US government, that's a quarter of a trillion dollars. And that got uh, Senator Grassley's attention, uh, who, if you're reading me um, about the Kavanaugh uh, confirmation hearings, uh, he's the head of the Judiciary Committee. Um, anyway, he ordered the government to conduct a report to see if uh, my co-author and I had lost our minds. Um, and the report said less money was at stake, but real money was at stake. Ultimately, uh, Congress passed Code Section 6045G. What does Code Section 6045G say? It may not be in your book. Is that with respect to marketable securities, security brokerage firms now have a responsibility to track the tax basis you have in your assets. Before the year 2011, when people got 1099s, all it said was how much they received, the amount, received, the, uh, uh, amount realized. Now, it will report your adjusted basis and gain and loss, all right, starting the year 2011. So, my point in raising this is, in my perfect world, we get rid of Code Section uh, 1014. <coughs> By the way, just so you know, in 1976, the then Carter administration, Jimmy Carter administration, repealed Code Section 1014, and there was a so-called carryover basis, very similar to Code Section 1015, but it, it was suspended in 1978, never went into effect, and then it was retroactively repealed in 1980. Um, in 2010, Congress toyed again with a carryover basis rule uh, in lieu of an estate tax. It really never went anywhere. But again, I would argue that 10, Code Section 1014 really doesn't belong in the code anymore. So, for whatever it's worth. Any questions on 1014? All right, now we're back to page 133. We're back to this problem where there's two blocks of stock, 
which one do you gift? Which one do you um, which one do you hold till death? So you're advising a client who's in his or her they're octogenarian, they're in their 80s. And do you advise them to gift to their daughter block one or block two and retain which block? Block one or block two? Michael? All right, based on that, I would say block two. You would say gift block one. No, gift block two. Gift block two. Yeah. Anyone have a different answer? Should anyone say gift block one? Correct answer. Gift block two. Why? Because if you give block two to the daughter, she'll get a carryover basis, right? At 950. And then when grandma dies, get a basis increase. So the total basis will be 1,950,000. By way of contrast, if you told to gift block one, well, take over the $50 basis, and they die, they get a thousand. The total basis here would be one thousand and fifty. So it would be a costly mistake to tell them to gift over block one. Block two is the right gift. Retain block one. Everybody got that? Next, we explore the amount realized. So, in the formula, under 1001, we have the amount realized, let's see, just the basis is gain or loss, right? But, I want to call to your attention, so the amount realized we know, under 1001B, includes cash, right? Cash and the fair market value of whatever you receive, right? That's 1001B. If you were to open up your regulations and you would check out regulation 1001-2. Everyone have regulation 1001-2? Two says except as otherwise provided in paragraph eight one eight one eight two and eight three, the amount realized from the sale or other disposition of property includes the amount of liabilities from which the transfer is discharged as a result of the sale or disposition. So I just want you to realize the regulations for your notes and next to code section ten oh one B, the amount realized not only includes cash not only includes the fair market value of property received, it includes also whatever debt you are relieved of, or your client is relieved of. cases. The first case is not a name drop. The first case is not a name drop. International Freedom Corporation v. Commission. It really stands for a pretty simple proposition. Suppose the taxpayer uses um, IBM stock worth 24000 your employer uses pays you with IBM stock for $24,000, in which it has a basis of $16,000. Every of them see the visual? The employer has a basis of sixteen, dollars uh, and the fair market value is $24,000. The question is, 
question is, if someone pays you with appreciated property, so your employer pays you with appreciated property, is that going to be considered a recognition event? Is that going to be considered a recognition event? If your employer pays you using appreciated property, what does this International Freighting Corporation say? Right. Yes. Yes. And there would result in an $8,000 gain. Nothing controversial about that. So if you use appreciated property to pay a debt, that's going to be tr treated as if the property were sold and the cash is used, right? Same thing. Everyone agree? That wouldn't the outcome have been the same if they had taken that stock, sold it, and then paid you with cash? Now, by way of contrast, Crane v. Commission is a very well-known case. And this is an name drop. This is probably on the top 10 list of famous cases out there. Crane v. Commission. And anyone, um, Leo, have a, have a chance to read this case? All right, Nick? Uh, so the petitioner was a sole beneficiary of her husband's will. All right, so picture if you will. Unfortunately, Mr. Crane died. Everyone got that? So if Mr. Crane died, what code section applies, Nick? Say again, say it loudly, is that here? By the way, some people ask me during break, it's an open book exam, but it doesn't hurt to write down after each class the three or four code sections that we're going to cover, right? Because if you have a quick summary and issues come up during the exam, you'll have a quick reference guide. Just by writing these things out, it's useful. So try to be proactive. So you heard Mr. Crane die, what code section applies? 1014, right? Code section 1014 applies. Crane is going to get a uh, basis equal to fair market value. Do you recall what the value of the property is? Yeah. Uh, it's two. 262. Look on page 137. It says the second full paragraph talks about three or four lines. As of the date the property was appraised, federal estate back purposes, the value is exactly equal to the total amount of the encumbrance. Okay, the encumbrance here was 255 plus interest of seven. So we know the fair market value here was 262. Okay? Now, she sells the property, right? Nick? Yeah. How much cash does Mrs. Crane receive? Uh, 1500. Well, does not she receive? Well, I'm not sold for three thousand. Does she receive three thousand? Uh, no, she received. She paid five hundred dollars. She had expenses of five hundred dollars. Okay. So she reports twenty five hundred. <coughs> report one half of your capital gains. All right? Everyone got that? So Mrs. Crane's position is she has reportable income of $1,250. 
Now, the IRS position is that Mrs. Crane had a building and land. And the adjusted basis of the building when she acquired it from Mr. Crane was 207, and the land was 55, and it totaled 262. Okay, everyone got this. The IRS bifurcated when, when Mr. Crane died. The overall basis was 262, and the IRS, truth be told, didn't have to really bifurcate it. Mrs. Crane or her accountant bifurcated this because they. Can you get depreciation deductions on land? No. No, it's not a wasting asset, right? You can only depreciate wasting assets. That includes a building, right? And you get a basis reduction on a building, right? Every year, take a, dep a depreciation deduction. And she took, Mrs. Crane took $28,000 of depreciation deduction. So what code section causes her basis to go down? What, what 1016, right? Yeah, 1016. 1016 causes your basis to go to 179. This becomes 55. So her overall basis becomes 234. Right? That becomes her adjusted basis. But the liability, how much did the liability, how much of the liability was paid down, Nick, do you recall? Uh, 200. Mm -hmm. Did any part of it paid down? No, it was 255,000. Right, the, the liability, they never, Mrs. Crane never paid down the principal amount of the liability. It remained at 255, right? Mm -hmm. So, if she sells it from the IRS perspective, how much cash did she receive? She received 2,500 essentially, right? Plus the liability, right? Yeah. So the IRS says um, 257.5 is her amount realized, and her basis is 234. So the IRS computes this gain to be. $23,500. Again, why? The IRS takes the position under Code Section 1001B that the amount realized, right, includes any debt. How much is the debt on this property? When the buyer buys this property, the buyer takes it subject to the debt, right? How much is the debt? $255. Elizabeth, what's the problem? I can't hear your question. Two hundred fifty-seven thousand five hundred. Because it's two fifty-five, which is the amount of debt, <coughs> plus the cash of twenty-five hundred. Dane, you got that? Could you just go with the numbers? Oh, what, what, what? Can you go with the numbers? I mean, this is her original basis. She took depreciation deductions. This becomes her. Adjust the basis after depreciation. And the amount realized is the amount of the debt plus the cash you received, the net cash you received. And the IRS computes gain of $23,500. Right? You gotta read this case closely. This is one of those you really should know. Why is the amount received to put the seven when she received one five hundred dollars? She received twenty five hundred plus she was relieved of debt of twenty two hundred and fifty five thousand. And we just read a regulation which wasn't in the books at the time, but Crane stands for the proposition you might realize when someone takes over your debt, is that a good thing? No. No? Oh, it's a good thing for you. <laughs> someone takes over your debt, you feel richer? <laughs> Absolutely, right? I don't, that to me is mixing apples and oranges. If I'm selling real estate and someone takes the property subject to my liability, that's considered en enriching me, Elizabeth. And we're not getting to short sales. That's a totally, a, a totally different 
the camel and a horse share some similarities, but they're not the same animal. Okay. All right? So who's right? I mean, she's reporting 1250, Iris is reporting 20, uh, 23,500. So the court, the US Supreme Court, has to do a little bit of soul searching here to figure out who's right. And it does it first by, this case is divided into two parts in terms of its analysis. And it turns to the code, and the first focal point is looking at the word basis, okay? The first thing it's gonna do is examine basis. And it does so at the beginning of page 139. Since logically, the first step under this scheme is to determine the unadjusted basis of the property. And remember, it refers to the pre-1954 code, right? Everyone agree? We're looking at something that predates the 1954 code. So the number system is a bit off here. And it says, what does the term property mean? Right? And what is the what does the Supreme Court do? Which is not unusual for the Supreme Court. Not unusual. It uses the dictionary. Because Mrs. Crane says she should only be taxed on her equity. Everyone agree? Yeah. Mrs. Crane says, look, I had an equity in this property of $3,000. That's the only thing I should be taxed on. So the court wants to examine what does the word property mean as used in Code Section 1001, right? Does it mean, is it synonymous with the word equity, right? And the court goes to several dictionary definitions. When it looks up the word property, is there any synonyms with the word equity, guys? And the answer is no. that the word property and the word equity do not mean one and the same. The word property and the word equity do not mean the same thing. Yeah. So first it looks up the word property, says it doesn't mean the same. Then next, in terms of determining basis, the court looks at whether or not, um, first of all, it, it says that uh, the IRS's administrative practice has always been to treat basis um, looking at uh, the fair market value of the property of debt. Beginning on page 140, uh, the next paragraph talks about Congress knows when it wants to use the word equity and knows how to use the word equity. And then on page 140, 141, it makes a very compelling argument that if you use equity instead of fair market value to determine the initial basis of the property, how would you depreciate property? Wouldn't the process of depreciation be a nightmare? Because doesn't equity fluctuate tremendously over the term of ownership? And it would become administratively impossible to take accurate depreciation deductions. So on page 140 and 141, the court draws the conclusion that on, on several different levels that the taxpayer is just flat out wrong. That for, in terms of determining adjusted basis, you should not use it, equity interchangeably and that the basis of the property should be the date of death value of 262 here. So on page 141, the last full paragraph, 
it includes the basis under, again, 1014 is the value of the property undiminished by mortgages. Okay? So next, once the court decides, once the court decides that the basis of the property is the initial fair market value, it then must look at what is the word amount realized. Is the amount realized look at just the equity? Does the amount realized just include the equity? Or does its scope go beyond equity to include the amount of the liabilities? And this court decides on the big, page 144 of the first full paragraph that the amount realized, after looking at several other things, that the amount realized includes the amount of liability. So Crane is an affirmation of the IRS administrative rulings for a long time that the amount realized, again, includes not only the cash you receive, the fair market value of the property you receive, it includes any liabilities from which you were re relieved. Recourse or non-recourse, doesn't matter. Right? Uh, I was just curious to know how they treated the, it doesn't seem like they include the interest on this. Do you know why they didn't include the interest? Because it's deductible. So under Code Section 163, the interest would have been deductible. So they ignore the interest. I mean, even though she's not paying it. Even though she's not paying it, because had she paid it, she would have deducted it. So it would have been a wash. OK? One. So that's the Crane case. That Crane, all kidding aside, is one of those cases that those in the know know what the Crane decision Meaning, If you practice tax, you really should know the Crane decision. Right? It's one of those name brand cases. People who practice tax know that name. Commissioner B. Tufts is a, a, a subsequent Supreme Court case that helps nail down One other issue, um, I don't know, in, th in this case, um, um, Annie, you have a chance to read it? Is that a yes? Yeah. Want to just tell us in general what happens here? Okay, so um, they, they borrow $1.85 million, okay. What happens next? Two years later, like uh, they're incurring a lot of losses, so decided. To All right. So one other fact you left out, and let me just see if I can erase this, um, is the taxpayer places they borrow one point eight five billion dollars, and they also contribute forty four thousand dollars of their own. Okay. So they borrow one million eight hundred and fifty one thousand to invest in property. They then borrow forty-four. Excuse me. They they make their own investment of forty-four thousand. Um, so their adjusted basis, right? Code section ten sixteen is one nine five one eight nine five seven twelve. Again, based on monies right in they borrow and they contribute their own money. Agreed. And they own this property for seven years. And what do they do during the seven years? With the property, guys, they take depreciation deductions, right? Right? And they take depreciation yeah. deductions of 439,972. Those are depreciation deductions. And Code Section 1016, right, Kathy, instructs that we reduce tax basis, right? By depreciation deduction. So our adjusted basis. Is one million four five five seven four zero. Are we in agree? 
And subsequently, it goes, the value of the property declines, right? To 1,400,000, right? And um, they walk away from the property, and um, I'm just trying to find my numbers here. Um, I believe that they each received a few dollars, but really they, they just walked away. It was non recourse liability. So they essentially just get the bank title to the property. Okay, everyone agree? They just get title to the property to the bank and they move on, right? Because the liability on the property, the liability on the property um, remained, and one of the, the, the liability remained at this number, right? Everybody, this property was underwater, right? Yeah. This is the liability, and this is the fair market value, right? So the property's underwater. And they walk away from the property. They say to the bank, have a nice day, here's the deed. So, Andy, what do they what what position do the taxpayers take? I think the part is the part of uh fifty five thousand the partnership loss of the tax return. Well, take a look on footnote one. The loss was the difference between the adjusted basis and the property's fair market value. And their individual tax returns, the partners did not claim their deduction, right? Annie? Do you see that? You're putting on one? Location? Page one, uh, 146. Yeah. You see? Put on one? You see that they didn't report the loss? Okay. Everyone see that? Yeah. Now let me give you what I call my, my primer and my what when taxpayers don't report losses, what does that usually signal? If your client says let's not report the loss. Is that, do you think their they're way of saying, let's help out Uncle Sam? Or do you think they might be hiding something of greater importance? Hiding something of greater importance? Probably. So the fact that they're not reporting the loss, to me, is perhaps camouflaging what might be a, 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 a more, a, how do I say it? A, a more onerous tax position. Because the taxpayers don't take this loss, right? This $55,000 loss. What is the IRS position here? Do you remember her, Andy? What's the IRS position here? Gain or loss? How much gain? The gain is, and how did the IRS get that? The gain is the difference between the net of the liability and um, the adjusted basis of the property, right? Everyone agree? That they consider the liability the amount realized. So the IRS computes a very, very significant gain here. Here, if you recall, again, the IRS wins. The IRS prevails that the amount realized, even though the property is now a lost property, the IRS takes the position that the liability, again, is considered the amount realized here. All right?
Justice O'Connor, first female Supreme Court justice, um, writes a concurring opinion. It's interesting, but for now, that's not the state of the law. So your job, guys, is any time there's potential, right? Any time there's a potential or there is a liability on property, be forewarned that you have potential gain recognition there. Any time there's a liability. So let's look at the problems on page 154. Mortgage or purchases a parcel of land from the seller for 100000 borrows $80,000 from a bank, and pays that additional. <coughs> Pays an additional twenty thousand dollars in cash to sell it, giving back a non-recourse mortgage on the, on, the, on the land. The land is security for the mortgage, which bears an adequate interest rate. What is mortgage's cost basis in the land? What is mortgage's cost basis? Have uh, it. What's the basis here? Okay, and w would you um, ag agree with that in this case, Julia? And if so, Julia, what's your authority? Say again, Julia? No one's dead. Pick her up. The question is right there. What's the basis in the property? What's your authority? Carla, what's the authority? I think it will be 10 12. 10 12, right? 10 12. 10 12. Everybody agree? Yeah. And as you pay down the mortgage, right? You borrow 80, put down a cash of 20, and you start paying down the mortgage. Does that change your basis, Ron? No. No, right? Everyone agree? Yeah. The expectation is you're going to pay off that liability anyway, right? Question 1B. Two years later, when the land is appreciated in value at 300000 the mortgager has only paid interest on the $80,000 mortgage. Mortgager takes out a second non recourse mortgage of 100000 with adequate rates of interest from the bank again using the land as security. Okay, so now the land's appreciated. You're going to take out a second loan for 100000 Does the mortgager have income when the mortgager borrows the money? So in this case, uh, David and Dan, what do you guys say? No. Dan? I think we got all that. No, when you borrow money, <coughs> Does anyone feel richer? If you do, I have a good bridge for you, right? Uh, you shouldn't feel any richer, and it's not an accretion to wealth, right? Yes, you have cash, but you have an offsetting liability. Question C, in that what's some case the author cited you to stands for that proposition? Question C, what is mortgagers' basis in the land if the $100,000 of mortgage proceeds are used to improve the land? So in this case, Jacqueline, what happens? Bases go up, down, stay the same. If you use the mortgage proceeds to improve the land. Go up, Jason, you agree? Mm -hmm. If it goes up, Brian, by what? What's your authority? Nick? Uh, 1016, right? And a new adjusted basis goes up by 100,000. So the new basis is 200,000, right? In contrast, what is mortgage's basis in the land at the $100,000 of mortgage proceeds are used to purchase stocks and bonds <coughs> worth 100,000? In that case, what happens to your basis, Leo? Um, your basis. Uh, where would it also be? Uh, 200,000. What did you have? Yeah, 100. Say again, John? Yeah, 100 so. 
he hundreds sell, right? Because there's no adjustment. If you use the 100,000 to acquire another kind of property, the basis in the land will remain the same. There's no taxes gain adjustment, right? I mean, they, just be careful about the fact pattern. Question eight. What results in D above if when the principal amount of the two mortgages, mortgage one and mortgage two, right? 80 and 100, and the land is still worth 300, mortgager sells the property subject to both mortgages to the purchaser for $120,000 of cash. Well, what's the amount realized here? Francis? Uh, my bad. It's 180. What, what's the amount realized? 180,000. And Mike, do you agree? No. Uh, three. Which one? You got this mic. Lower tier mic. Uh, it would be 300. Why 300? Uh, the liability of 180 plus the, or I'm sorry, who, whose basis? Not so the basis, what's the amount realized? Oh, the amount realized would be 300. Why? Uh, the cash proceeds of 120 plus the liability of 180. So the amount realized is 300, what's the basis? Uh, the basis was still 100. So the basis is 100, the gain is how much? 200. Gain is 200, recognized under code section 1001C. Yes. Okay. What is purchaser's basis? Angie in the in the property purchaser acquires. So isn't it 120,000? Andrew, agree or disagree? Agree. Okay. Jacqueline, final word. Agree. Agree. Well, maybe not the final word then. I gotta ask. Brian, final word? I agree. Upper tier, Mike, you agree? Yes. Doesn't your basis include the amount you spent? How much did the purchaser spend here? <coughs> Say again? 300. 300. Yeah. It's the 120 plus the 180. So the basis here to the purchaser for your notes is 300, not 120, right, guys? What's my authority? Code section 1012. Question F. What results in the facts of D above if mortgagers gives the land subject to the mortgages uh, still worth 300000 to her son? So is it a nice mom's giving son the property? Everybody agree? Everybody agree? Yes, very nice on mom's part, right? <laughs> so Hara and Kathy, any gain or loss to mom? Say again? I don't hear you. So there is a gain? There is no gain? There is a gain. How much? There's a gain of 80. And Annie, you agree? Mom's giving this property to son. Son's being happy. Son is working a champagne bottle. Mom just gave a very generous gift. No. Annie, what? You don't agree? Julia, any gain or loss? Well, when mom gives this property, doesn't she have an amount realized in 180? What's her basis? 100. So the gain here is 80, guys, right? The gain here is 80. And what is the basis, Sahara Kathy, to the son who gets the property? To say it loudly? What's your authority? Code section or regulation 1015-4, right? Regulation 1015-4 says it's the greater of the of the the greater the transfer's basis, which is 100, or the amount paid. And here it's deemed to be 180. So the son's basis would be 180 here. So if your notes, when you go back through, the answer to problem F 
is mom has an $80,000 gain, son has a $180,000 basis. The son's basis, my authority is regulation 1015-4. Question G, what results in F above, the mortgager gives the land to her spouse rather than to her son? What is the spouse's basis in the land? So in this case, David, Nick, up in here, David, Nick. So go ahead, David and Nick, gain or loss? No gain, what's your authority? No gain, no loss? You fail? No gain, no loss. What's your authority? EK? 1041. 1041, right? EK, what's the what's the wife's basis in the property she acquires? I, I forget if she sold it or if he sold it. Um, what is spouse's basis? EK. Ron, what's the spouse's basis? EK, what's the basis? John, lower tier, John. John, what's the basis? Me? Yeah. Uh, still 100. Still 100, right? 1041B. The basis is still 100, and even when he pays off the mortgage, stays at 100, right? Question H. What result to mortgage under the facts of D above? The land declines in value from 300 to 180. And mortgager transfers the land by quick claim deed to bank. So now it's just going to walk away from the property. Okay? Dane, Patrick, what do you guys say? Um, there's the fair market value 180, and then you reject the as again. Patrick, you agree? That sounds about right to me. What's your authority? Um, oh, no. 1001. You now realize it includes the liability. 180, the basis of 100. Now, would your outcome change, Gainer or Patrick, if the value of the property declined instead of 180, declined below the fair market, below the amount of the liability to 170? Would your answer change, guys? Patrick, any change? I'm not sure. Okay. Elizabeth, do you want to, do you want to take your crack in it? Name? Alvin? Does this remind you of our back pattern here, Matt? Yeah. Gifting anything to a bank, right, Ben? So what would apply here, Ben? Two. Talks about suppose investor had three acres of land. 
each acre worth 100,000, and he bought for 300,000. Investor sold one of the acres for 140, and the second one for um, 160. So he bought three acres, each one for 100, 100, 100, right? And he sold one for 140, one for 160. Can he front load and says, say he has no gain the first two years, and he makes the sale? Can he do that? And if you read the regulations, the answer is no. You don't get to cherry pick. You have to report a $40,000 gain in year one, a $60,000 gain in year two. You don't, the regulation makes clear that you can't play games with front loading your basis. Now, we are going to finish, no doubt, chapter six when we come back next Monday. But, we are going to skip, and it's very important that you skip, to, if you, I already came for the day, to chapter 21. Why? Why are we skipping all this for the time being? Because once we figure out computationally how much gain or loss, our next job, guys, is to figure out the character of the income. All right, so our next job is going to be what is the character of the income that we recognize. So for our next class, we're not going to finish the entire chapter 21. It's a long chapter.